Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for coming out. When uh, Sue asked me to speak about my experience over this past year, I suggested that people bring Kleenex because <laughs> it's one of those kind of deals. And uh, anyway, it's I'm, I'm just speaking about my experience. So um, that's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm breaking my talk into three parts. My girl. Guilt, uh, grief, and uh, divine grace. Okay. What I want to start with is just a, a brief email that I received not that long ago from a very good friend of mine, uh, Abbot Joseph Morris from Gregory Palamas Monastery in Ohio. And I'm just going to read it because it really does uh, give an idea of what I have in mind for tonight. So I'm reading. May he send you help from his sanctuary. It was more than great, great to speak with you a few weeks ago. It was very edifying and inspiring to hear both of. I think I'll be the one that needs to play next. To hear both of Lynn's courage and defiance of death. And even your present grief is the reality of losing a wife with whom you shared life at the deepest level. If we have time at the end, I'd like to share with you how we got married. <laughs> That'll bring a little bit of levity. Because <laughs> we're not going to have a whole lot between now and then. Anyway, a year ago March, our life got turned upside down when Lynn went in for what was like a she thought it was just a pain in her side, and it turned out to be a very aggressive uh, cancer, a rare cancer, fourth stage colon cancer, which they have they have nothing to do with. They have they have very little research on because they don't make enough money on rare things, and so that was the situation we found ourselves in, and it literally turned our lives upside down and you start having to face the issue itself when your wife begins chemotherapy then you find out that every day in the week has something that has to be done a shot hydration all manner of things and your life really changes and I decided on the front end that I was going to do everything I could to care for my wife. I thought, I am not gonna live with regrets. I am not gonna let this time go by and say, gee, I, if I had just not gone to so many meetings and taken care of so many things that I should have been taken care of, uh, I could have given my wife more time uh, with uh, between ourselves. I mean, we definitely went through, this time of the year last year was very much a dark night of the soul, to trying to, uh, Come to grips with it. You know, what do you, what do you say when you're the priest and your wife says, Honey, how come I can't have a miracle? Everybody else has miracles. And now you're sitting there and you think, I don't have an answer. Suddenly, I just, I don't know anything, you know. And so we got through that. We realized that we were sinking and that we were really drifting from God. And so we made every effort we could by re just, just sitting down and restructuring our lives and facing up to what we had to face up to. And so we did. And Lynn, God bless her, uh, as Bishop, as not Bishop, but uh, Abbot Joseph said, he made reference to her defiance of death. She, she defied it. When Bishop Joseph came to pray for her in the hospital, she. She spent the last two month, months of her life in two different hospitals for various reasons. She, um, she just looked at him, Bishop, Bishop Joseph said, say, Edna, I'm not afraid. And so he, he got down on his knees in this, in this hospital and he prayed for her and he anointed her and he anointed me. And there were a couple of other people that happened to have been visiting with us 
at the time. It was, really, it was just really blessed. And God gave us the time to, to say goodbye. But not just for me. I think just about everybody in the parish came at one time or another. One day there were 34 visitors and the hospital was saying, well, who is this woman? And I felt like saying, if you only could know, if you could only know, because, you know, she was, she was a remar remarkable, remarkable person. Uh, I, I began to tease her after a while in marriage. We would have been married 47 years this summer. 4th of July. And I got to the place, and ladies, you'll appreciate this. I thought, I just do whatever she says. Because, you know, she's right most of the time. And if she isn't right, she probably she's close to it. So, um, you know, we had, we had just a, a wonderful, wonderful marriage. Uh, it was idyllic. It was, it couldn't have been more perfect. Uh, than what we had. And she had all, all of her godchildren would come and she made sure that they all had a gift ready. She, she picked out keepsakes, icons for every one of them. And she has, oh my gosh, she has so many. I remember Salome or, or Sybil, I saw Sybil. There's, there's Sybil. Is Salome here tonight? I'm sorry. Salome, Sybil's old eldest daughter, she came almost every night those, those last those last weeks, those last couple of months in the hospital. And sometimes they would just hold hands and look at each other. I mean, it was the most beautiful thing. The, there were the nuns from that monastery in Maryland. I can't remember the name of the St. Nina's maybe. Is that it? And I asked Lynn afterwards, I said, well, what are you, what are you ladies talking about? I didn't see anybody's lips move. <laughs> and she said, we didn't talk. We just, you know, we communicate with our eyes. I said, okay. <laughs> Until the, the nun had to go and the nun said, I hate to leave you. And Lynn said, I don't want you to leave. The choir came, part of the choir came one night and Whenever they said what else, I'd say, just sing. <laughs> Ruth knows that from years of working with me. Whenever there was a problem, I would just say, just sing. <laughs> she said, what should I sing? I don't care, just <laughs> sing. <laughs> and so she did. And the choir would, right. and the choir, and the choir would sing. And they sang forever that night. And life at the hospital just stopped because the angels had arrived. And they were they were singing, and it was it was just it was just wonderful. Before she went in the hospital, I'd come home and here was here was Nan with recipes for people with cancer. Here was Lorraine cleaning up the house. There were there was there was Alex. One night I come home, she's singing Vespers. When she wasn't singing Vespers, when and Alex were watching baseball games. <laughs> and uh, it was just, it was absolutely, it was absolutely beautiful. It was a very beautiful, beautiful time. Kurt, Rowdy Bush, he called every Monday. Father, what do you need at the store? Oh, we need a couple of bananas. Okay, a couple dozen bananas. Uh, <laughs> we need a little bit of water. Okay, two flats of water. You know, everything we needed was doubled or tripled or whatever. And he was there. He was there. Um, I mean, people were just were just there to serve her, and there were some women that were there, I think, almost every day. And these were the women that were with her with her when she died. And it was it was a very wonderful wonderful death that she had for a Christian ending to her life, painless, blameless, and peaceful, and a good defense before the dread judgment seat of Christ. She was not afraid. And she had everybody come by to see her, who she wanted to say goodbye to. Um, she picked out all her clothes. Uh, I don't know why the mortuary charged her so much to do her hair. There wasn't much left, and she wore a head covering. But nonetheless, that's that's what happened. And then on 
the night before she died, I know Father LaFoon came. He came first. Father Michael came later and did the prayers for those who were about to die and the departing of the soul. And I was expecting just a few family members and gee, it seemed like half the church showed up. And it was, it was just so moving. I went home, the, the doctor, one of the doctors sent me home. They were afraid for me. <laughs> I was sort of losing it. I was, I was falling apart. So Peter and Alex and my sister Vicki spent the night praying and singing and telling jokes to her. She was on the machine. She couldn't, you know, she'd already talked at last, but that was all right. They were there, they were there with her. I, when I showed up the next morning, they had, they had all gone home. And the ladies that were usually faithfully there with her, were there with her. And, and were there when she, when she died. Um, I got there just, just as they were ready to pronounce. Then we prayed some more. We prayed the prayers again. You, just to let you know, you can pray these prayers all you want. And so we, we didn't want her to miss anything. Uh, we had ladies in the church who she chose to dress her afterwards. Uh, she got involved with that. Shelly Shelley called and she said, Father, can I have your permission to come out and, and take a week and just care for your wife? I said, yeah, <laughs> I think so. And so uh, Shelly Duarte came out and just, it was, it was just, it was absolutely, absolutely beautiful. And then after we prayed, I, I knew enough that we needed to get out of there before they took her out. And just as we were starting to leave, I turned around, I took one last look at her, and she smiled. She smiled. And that was it. That was it. And uh, then came the funeral. I think regarding the funeral, the only reason I had these notes is I wanted, didn't want to forget anything. But anyway, I remember sort of changing gears here. Kira came up to me at the time when you go by the casket, and she just looked at me with the utmost of seriousness, and she said, welcome to the club. I'm not quite sure what she means by that, but I, I think she means something. And it wasn't very long before I realized what she meant. The narrative, if you've had a sweet marriage, the narrative pretty much remains the same. Everybody's story, at least in the church that I've talked to, who've had a lovely, beautiful, God-blessed marriage, we're sharing the same things. Um, I wrote a letter to Father Anthony Yossi at the camp. His wife died a year ago, last month I think it was. He was he was doing liturgy for the kids at camp and his wife was out somewhere and had a massive cardiac arrest and, and died. I could have written his letter and he could have written mine because we were sharing the same Needs the loneliness, the sadness, and the grief. Kevin Allen, at that same time, urged me to get a hold of somebody. I've never been one when somebody says, get a hold of somebody, to really jump on it. For some reason, there's this little thing in me that a sign that goes up says, I don't want to get a hold of somebody. Uh, but he said, you got to get a hold of this man. You got He's going to be a big help to you. And in, in kindness to Kevin, he knew him from his radio show. I, I decided, okay, I'll write him. It was late on a Monday night. It was, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll get a hold of him Tuesday. Well, it was almost Tuesday. I wrote him a letter, email, sent the letter out. By the time I got up the next morning, I had a response from a man that would become very important in my life, my grief counselor. I'm going to try to read the letter. Uh, it says, my dear brother, 
I'm crying with you in the name of grief and separation, in the time of grief and separation. I do not say lost because she is still with you and hears your words and knows your grief. It is hard to find our way when we perceive their bodily absence and our loneliness. You, my brother, are walking through deep waters and are in need of help. Not only from the Lord, which you have, but from fellow Christians. I, I guess if we are honest, we must conclude that all the words and scripture quotations of the world seem to do nothing compared to the loss of her physical presence with you right now. What you wouldn't give for just one touch, one word, one more kiss or hug in order to feel the two having become one again. Brother, I understand. We know all the theology, but when it hits home, it is hard to apply to ourselves. Physician, heal thyself. We are weak. Now we're weaker than we have ever been or ever known before as a very real part of us has been severed from us, though temporarily. Jesus wept, not just for Lazarus, but because he was moved by the grief he saw others going through, and he most certainly is weeping with you, as am I at present. For now I will not give you scripture verses or quaint platitudes in order to console you. But Father, I will weep with you, and believe me, I am, and take upon myself some of your brokenness, because in Christ I love you. And I'm called to do just that. Yes, we have hope. Yes, we do not despair as the world does, but we do hurt. We do grieve. We do feel the pain of loss and loneliness. Father, I am willing to walk with you through this. We have never met, and yet God in his infinite wisdom has brought us together to bear one another's burdens. And that's okay. That's a good thing. That's his mysterious wisdom at work, but also a sign of his unfailing love towards you. I have learned to die many times over with those I've ministered to in the past. A crucifixion of sorts, but it is what I have been called to do. In some ways, our lives have a similar story, which we can share later together. To talk about her life with me and your fears are both necessary and helpful to you. And yes, we will both cry. It's okay. Believe it or not, even in this great weakness, you are feeling even helplessness. You are still a priest and God will use you. I have no doubt to minister to me. You will see, Father, I give you myself any time of day or night that you may need me. I am now committed to you, not because we have known each other for years, but because we have and do know him, the one who conquered death by death and unites us in himself, even though distance separates us. If I could come over and physically hug you, I would, but my heart will in our, our conversations. Grief is a season we must embrace Yet no one told us it would be this hard. My brother, I am yours going forward. Lean on me, call me, talk to me, cry with me. I will share your broken willingness from my heart because I have this treasure in an earthen vessel. That the excellency of the power is not for me, but God. And this he will use what little I had to come alongside a brother in need. But you must make use of it. And as you feel the paralysis of the darkness of despair creeping in, reach out for the light, as hard as that is, for when you are weak, then you are strong in Christ. Things will never be what you knew as normal again until you fly home to your beloved. But the end has not come for you yet. And your calling has not ceased even though you're retired. You're retired. And my wife died on the 30th November, and my retirement started December 1st. Growth will and can still occur, as even now. 
You learn to use your mortality for your immortality. Talk to her, laugh with her, cry with her. She hears you. For now I will sit with you and pray, but we will have to get up and live again, for life is for the living. Things have not come to an end. So I leave you with this encouragement in Christ, that you are his special workmanship in Christ Jesus, and are now once again in the desert of dry and seemingly parched land. But you know as well as I do that he can bring, he can bring blossoms and beauty out of ashes. And he will, but for now, we do all we can just to get up each day and go on. As we go forward, I feel talking on the phone is the best way since email cannot convey to hearts or emotions. And that is a vital medicine we need. We are weary travelers in a land of thorns and thistles, but we have a sure guide and his love is everlasting. And he says, my peace, I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. You believe it, believe in God, believe also in me. And so we will. And let's talk over the phone when you are ready. Call any time. By this time, I'm having trouble reading the letter because I'm, I'm just weeping, just weeping like I've never wept before. And by the time I get to the end of the letter, I know that I have to call this man. And I have to call him now, right now. And so I did. Except I couldn't talk. I was weeping so hard I couldn't talk. But I punched in the numbers. And he answers the phone. He says, Father Wayne? No, he's, I just, I, yeah, I say, Father Wayne? I said, uh-huh. He says, I thought so. And then we began a relationship that's still going on today. A man who's been a tremendous help to me. A man who has lived up to his word. I can call him anytime and I can get the help that I need. Even though those of you who've been in the spot know that you need the encouragement, but it's like it's getting, it's like pouring water into a bucket that has a hole in the bottom. It doesn't stay with you for very long. But yet, you know what? You still need it. <laughs> it's like, just, just please pour it, pour it, because I need it. But if I have to call you back in an hour, I might have to do that. Father Wayne, is that you? <laughs> Uh, it was me. I think from his letters, his letter there, anyway, I have a couple uh, more to read. You get the idea of just grief. Just what, what the grief feels like. It feels like hell. It feels awful. And as much as you want it to be gone, it doesn't go. You know, one of the things we teach in the Orthodox Church, I mean, from the scriptures, but we believe it, not everybody does, that the two become one. And they do. They do become one. And when that other one is taken away, it's like an imputation. I mean, it's, it's like nothing I've ever experienced before in my life. Kira saying, welcome to the club. Now I hear what she's talking about. It's really difficult. But I still must turn to God for his grace. I have a, uh, a niece who's in a physician assistant uh, program. She's in the last part. She just has a couple months to go. And last summer they had what they call the white coat ceremony. In the white coat ceremony, they go and not too complicated. They get their white coat and then uh, wherever they go in a hospital or the doctor's office, they got to wear that just like the doctor does. And it's a symbol of something. It's a symbol of being a healer. And as I started thinking about it, I realized we're not too much unlike a physician's assistant. 
When did you get your white coat at baptism? You got a white coat. Oh, we call it a baptismal gown. But we tonight we can call it a white coat. Which made you not only remember that you are to give, but that you also receive. That you are broken, but even in your brokenness you give. Everybody, everybody in church needs to be healed. It's a place of healing. But everybody in church also needs to turn around and be a co-sufferer with the other and enter into that healing with them. <coughs> and that's what I've begun to see. I've, I've had to experience life in a different way. It's not the same as it ever was before. From the smallest to the greatest, I need, I need somebody in a white coat. You become a very needy person really fast. Every Sunday, coffee hour, Salome comes up and she gives me a kiss. It's, 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 it's beautiful. It's beautiful. For the women's lunch or Annunciation tea, whatever it was, she wanted permission to use some of Korean Lynn's dishes. And if you knew my wife, you knew that everything's blue and white. And she was born on a Dutch island, folks. <coughs> Those are the only two colors you have on Aruba. <coughs> and I said, Well, Salome, I'm not really using the fine china much these days. So you go ahead and take whatever you want, my dear. So she, as some of my talk, Salome went through all the dishes and she got all the stuff she needed. It was very, it was beautiful. And then every Sunday she makes sure she greets me. John Cassian, I don't know what he is, with 13, 14, I don't know. I lose track. But he can read me. He can read me. I sit in the vestry during liturgy. Because liturgy is the hardest service for me. When that pattern comes out and I see those little particles that represent the living and the dead, I just lose it. You can tell time by, by looking at me. I just lose it. I, I do not have the composure at this point to do a service. And July 4th was our, would have been our 47th anniversary. And I can tell you about that afterwards. And you'll find out what it was like to be a child of the 60s. <laughs> Just before the last liturgy before our, our anniversary. For, you know, memories, the, the memories, you want memories, but yet they kill you every time. They're bittersweet. They're sweet for her. <laughs> She's with the Lord. <laughs> Bitter. Bitter for the one who's here, in a certain sense. I mean, you're trying to balance this out, but I'm also just telling you the truth, how how it works. And the and the memory that came to mind was the last look I had at St. Luke's that day at her funeral. She was as beautiful in death as she was in life. She was just lovely. But then here's the pattern. And I had to take communion. I thought, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I can do this. But I did. And you notice the altar servers always get a chair ready because I guess I'm about, I must look like I'm ready to collapse. <laughs> I guess I am. You know. uh, the day when we blessed the graves during Bright Week, my legs just started going out. And found out by that weekend that I had a severe spinal uh, stenosis. And so I've been, being, been treated for that, but I have no legs without a podium or a podium with wheels. And so that's, that's maybe gonna t get taken care of, God willing. But she's there, she's there. And I remember I mean, the, the children, the influence that she had on children was phenomenal. 
Aaron, not Aaron, Noah. Noah Byers, Aaron's son, made a fluorescent bracelet for her. Well, she was still alive, and she gave it, she put it on. And I do explain to the guy at the funeral home, I said, she's gonna wear that. She's gonna wear it, don't touch it. Because they take an inventory, you know. Everything's so careful, so clinical. But she wore it. He wanted to go to the grave a couple weeks ago. And some of us went with him. He wanted to leave a note for Curry Lynn. He wanted to talk to her. One of the Hensel girls wrote me a letter a few weeks ago. This is the thing with the memories. You just get all these beautiful notes. And they're lovely. And you want to say, honey, how about that? Oh, she's not there. And so you, you, get, you enter into that, that, that living with the tsunami of, uh, of emotion. But anyway, so little Noah went to the grave and wrote her a note. The little Hensler girl wrote me and she said, Father, is it okay if I talk to Lynn? I said, honey, I do every day. So you should do it too. She said, I cry every time I think of her. Do you have a picture of her? And, and with Tony's help, we got a picture of her. I think they, did you cut me out of the picture? Did you? <laughs> I don't know. She just wanted Lynn. When was, when was the star? So anyway, that was wonderful. But there were very many people with white coats that surrounded her. She was loved. She was loved. And the people with the white coats haven't come to get me yet. They're still, I've got, I'm dealing with the white coats in church. And the meals and the, the kindnesses are just a super big deal. Just They're just a big deal. Everything counts. Everything matters. There's some other people I want to mention as well who shared that divine grace, which is kind of unusual. One of them was a doctor I have. He's an Egyptian doctor. His name's Dr. Maddy, M-A-D-Y. He's not Coptic, so don't ask. Uh, he's part of a, um, a, a small group of Christians from Egypt. And, you know, I think if you stay in Egypt long enough, it becomes, becomes a small group of Christians. <laughs> and so when I first went to him, he asked how I was and all that. And I'm I'm very transparent. In fact, I decided that, you know, ever since this whole adventure began, I just thought, you know what? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna be what I'm gonna be. And I said, Doctor, my wife is diagnosed with cancer. And he's he stopped, he stopped our little office interview. It's my first visit. He says, what's her name? Lynn. Then I'm going to pray for her right now. Right now. So he prayed for her in a beautiful, beautiful, humble prayer as I'm watering the, 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 the room with my tears. <laughs> and then he looked at my legs. It's a vascular thing regarding diabetes, okay? And so he has to look at my legs. He looks at my legs for one second or whatever. And in prior appointments, he'd say, okay, uh, looks good, see you in three months. This time he said, looks good, I'll see you in a month. And I said, a month? You said it looks good. He said, yeah, I know. I just want to see you. And this is my doctor. Well, by the time that that month, couple, actually, this went on for several months. But I, uh, when I did come back in December, I said to him, I said, you know, I'm having a terrible time driving up Beach Boulevard because she's buried at Westminster Mortuary. And I said, I can't, I, I can't drive past this place without just having problems. And um, he said, Father, she's not in a cemetery. She's in a garden. Don't, haven't you read that unless the grain the seed, the grain falls into the earth and dies, it won't bring forth fruit. It's Lynn's garden, not a cemetery. And so you'll hear us say, well, we're gonna go see Lynn at the garden. 
and that's where we're headed. And so that's what we do. And that's Dr. Maddie. Dr. Maddie has been very, very faithful. Then there was Father Anthony, who I've already mentioned to you. We've, we've talked on the phone, we've, we've shared, shared mail, mail. And uh, like I say, the narrative is the same. I could write his story, he could write mine, with a few exceptions. But then there's Bishop John, Bishop John Abdullah. You know, um, he called me. And when a bishop calls you, you get a little nervous. And this was on, in March, because it, he found out through Father Anthony that it was the anniversary of Lynn's first, the first surgery and first discovery of the cancer. It was a Saturday night, it was the Saturday I remembered that we changed the clocks, okay? I'm sitting at home eating dinner, and uh, he says, Father Wayne, this is Bishop John. And, uh, hi. <laughs> <coughs> What's he calling me for? <laughs> well, he called to see how I was. He might wear a black robe, but he also wears a, a white a white coat. And he called to see how I was. And we talked for about 45 minutes to an hour. His wife has been, had passed away 10 years ago. And we should have put her in her 50s and him in his 50s. She had cancer. And he said, Father, there's not a day that I don't grieve over her and think about her. He said, it changes some with time. But he said, I shed tears even to this day. He said, don't be afraid to shed a tear. It's okay. It's okay to cry. I called him as well just before 4th of July. 4th of July was kind of a tough time for Father Wayne. Uh, you know, just the image of Lynn and then as, she, as she was beautiful, even in death. You know, I had to talk. I talked to everybody I knew. Because that hole in the bucket seemed to be getting bigger. And I just thought, you know, why should I be shy? So I just called. But Father, Father, he used to be Father. He, wears his, he still wears his wedding ring. He says he's the only married bishop in the Orthodox Church. <laughs> but he's been a big help as well. He's a trained therapist. And so I've been fortunate to have been blessed as some very, very helpful people. And believe me, I need it. I need it. I'm just not the same person I was. Something's happened. I had an amputation. But the last person I want to just draw attention to is a person named Emmett. You don't know Emmett. Though we remembered him in the great entrance the first time I met him. Emmett's a homeless guy. Has a little box outside CVS. I don't know what he's collected for. Lynn always gave him money. She gave money to everybody. One time in a parish council meeting, uh, I think Armin was president. He said, you know, we got to be careful with our finances because, you know, people who are falling behind and, and, and giving for like the mortgage and whatnot, a little extra giving. Somehow my wife found out about it. And so she began making up through our checkbook, everybody who was falling short. And I think I, I, I started the evening out by saying that, you know, I found out that she was, she was usually right. And so when she told me, I said, honey, where's the money going? She said, well, she said, some people weren't paying up, so somebody's got to cover the lack. I said, thousand thoughts going through my mind. I think, well, should I say something? I said, said to myself, no, 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 she's, she's, she's more righteous than I am. She's more holy, far more generous. So I just, I said, okay, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> so anyway, this is Emmett. And um, I remember meeting Emmett while she was still alive. And Peter, I think, was uh, yet to get back from Afghanistan. And uh, I, I, I just 
met him coming out of CBS one day and we chatted and I explained that Lynn had cancer and that, uh, you know, Peter was overseas. I said, please, please pray for them. And, I, and we exchanged the needs for each other. And then shortly after she passed away, I was over at CBS getting some, some meds. And uh, I looked, it was, it always wears this dark hoodie, which was sort of menacing. And I was walking out and I saw him in the shadows. And I looked and I said, Emma, is that you? He says, yeah, Father, yeah. So I went over and he said, how are they? I said, well, my, my wife died. So here we are. Emmett, with his ragged, raggy, dirty hoodie, he grabs hold of me, I grab hold of him, and he starts praying. And I start doing what I know best to do any day, any of these days, and that's cry. So I'm crying, and he's praying, and I'm crying some more, and he's praying, and I thought, Emmett, are you going to stop? I think we got it covered. <laughs> but he kept praying, and that was okay. That was okay. And I went in, I got my purchase, I came out, and he waves me over and says, Father, come here. I said, what is it? He gave me a piece of paper. His name, Emmett, with his phone number. He says, he says, call me anytime. Father, I'm here for you. From the words of Dr. Dr. Timothy, my grief counselor, he said, it is only in these moments that the grace of Christ can carry us. Loss is a type of pain no one can truly share unless they have gone through it, and even then, only partially. The loss of a spouse is the sundering of a body, the tearing of a limb from its wholeness, the separation of the two who became one. There is nothing easy or joyful in the feeling, but there can be consolation in the memories, a consolation mixed with pain, a type of longing for their presence with us again. This we can focus on, but we will never escape the pain or hurt. Rather, we are being made into a human being precisely through that pain and hurt with the end product not only being whole again, but able to dwell with them again for eternity. Indeed. Eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Hope is an anchor for our soul. Stay strong and exercise hope in that what's to come. Be malleable in the master's hand. Then this final response from him and then I think one last response. I. I had, I, had, I had called him a few days before 4th of July, as I told you guys. This whole memory thing, it's, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. It's, it's rough. But he wrote me this note, and this is beautiful. You say, may the Lord allow me to bear some of your hurt and longing so that his grace can be felt in your pain. I ask this, Lord, for my friend. Amen. Dr. Dr. Tim. That's co suffering. And now something from somebody local. The LaFoons wrote me a note quoting from John Chrysostom. An intelligent, discreet, and pious young woman is worth more than all the money in the world. Tell her that you love her more than your own life because this present life is nothing and that your only hope is that the two of you pass through this life in such a way that in the world to come, you will be united in perfect love. That's the end of the quote. But then either Father the Foon or Donna penned the last part. She did her part. Now, Father, you have to finish yours. That's, that's friendship. And then one last thing in closing, something that helps me daily remember that, that this is not the end. 
It's, it's, it's the series of, 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 of quotes by St. Cyprian of Carthage, the martyr. And I'll just read it if I can see it. We might, we ought never to forget, beloved, that we have renounced the world. We are living here now as aliens and only for a time. When the day of our homecoming puts us, puts an end to our exile, frees us from the, band, the bonds of the world, and restores in us paradise to a kingdom. We should welcome it. What man stationed in a foreign land would not want to return to his own country as soon as possible? Well, we look upon paradise as our country. And a great crowd of our loved ones awaits us there. A countless throng of parents, of brothers, and children longs for us to join them. Assured though they are of their own salvation, they are still concerned about ours. What joy both for them and for us to see one another and embrace. Oh, the delight of that heavenly kingdom where there is no fear of death. Oh, the supreme and endless bliss of everlasting life. There is the glorious band of apostles. There the exalted assembly of prophets. There the innumerable host of martyrs crowned for their glorious victory in combat and in death. There in triumph are the, the virgins who subdued their passions by the strength of continence. There the merciful are rewarded, those who fulfilled the demands of justice by providing for the poor in obedience to the Lord's command. They turned their earthly patrimony into heavenly treasure. My dear brothers, let all our longing be to join them as soon as we can. May God see our desire, may Christ see this resolve that springs forth from faith, for he will give the rewards of his love more abundantly to those who have longed for him more frequently. And that's my story. Thank you. Do I turn to tell a wedding story? Please. On a lighter note, <laughs> we were college sweethearts in the 60s. There you go, children of the 60s. And we, as we like to say, if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. <laughs> it was a different time, but a lot of what took place in the 60s, as wild and crazy as it was, and as anti-authority as we were, God used it to prepare many people for the Orthodox Church. I don't know, maybe we got sick of where we were, I'm not sure, but whatever the case was, so many of my friends came from that time period. And so, we were young. I think I proposed when I was 21 and she was 19. Oh yeah. Uh, the way I did it lacked any grace at all. I didn't know what to do. I'd never been married before. <laughs> so instead of asking for her father's hand in marriage, for her hand in marriage, we're at dinner one time at a folks' house. And we had already, well, I should back up and say, my roommate was my wise roommate friend. He says, that's good, you're becoming friends. Because she had just left for Europe for three months. We'd be starting to develop a friendship. He says, that's good, that's good. Then she comes back and he says, but I forgot to tell you, a girl doesn't want to marry her friend. I thought, oh, gee. <laughs> you know, thanks a lot. Now that I'm her friend, she won't want to marry me. Well, I was determined she was going to marry me. And so we dated two weeks and I proposed. Yep, two weeks, two weeks. She was going to dump me because she thought, what's wrong with this guy? Two weeks? 
for two weeks. But you know, you don't do that. But I was so confident that this was what we needed to do. She told me, she said, I just hung on thinking maybe it'll work, maybe something good will work out here. Well, she said she, she finally put the big A in on her yes. Actually, she didn't say yes after, we, after it. She said, okay, I'm game. <laughs> Which was not the most romantic thing either. <laughs> so anyway, she had a part to play in this. So anyway, uh, but we did have enough wisdom to know if we tell our parents after two weeks we want to get married, well, that's it. Her, her father will commit a first class felony. And he'll be in jail and won't be dead. And so we decided we would wait until the spring. And so we didn't tell anybody. We just kept it our, our secret. So we're at dinner one night. And I thought, well, this is a good time. Once again, we were just, we were children of the 60s. We were not clear on protocols and <laughs> such things. Well, Frank, Barbara, Lynn, uh, Lynn and I are going to get married. It got very quiet. And it stayed quiet for months. <laughs> not just that evening. <laughs> And I thought, well, okay, you, you, you just, you did it, Wilson. And her parents threatened they weren't going to come to the wedding. I thought, well, you're already mad at me anyway, so <laughs> maybe it doesn't matter. So we were supposed to get married. Remember now, we were Jesus people. We were, we were hippies. We did not believe in the institutional church. No. <laughs> what has changed? What has changed in this picture? Okay. So we we're going to get married in uh, Jack and Marjorie's living room up on the hill in Seal Beach. Okay, that sounds good. July 10th. Now, what's that have to do with July 4th when we really got married? <laughs> well, we were down at the beach doing what any people any people would do who lived at the beach. We were down there on the sand. July 3rd. And I see my buddy come down and he says, I gotta talk to you. Let's go up to my house. We all lived with him. I mean, here, it was close enough to have a waves break. It was a beautiful time. He said, we have a little problem. Jack and Marjorie just got a new carpet in their house. And they don't want to have a wedding there. <laughs> so we, we don't have a place for your wedding. I said, oh, gee. <laughs> I said, I didn't feel it. Suddenly my knees feel like they do, they do now from the stenosis thing. I said, well, what what are we going to do? He said, well, why don't we have it at the Bible study the next night? Our wedding at the Bible study. I said, oh, gosh. My life was passing in front of me. I thought, I, uh, I guess I need to talk to Lynn about this, don't I? He says, yeah, I think so. So let's get down and get her. So we brought Lynn up to his house. I thought, oh, geez. I said, honey, here's the deal. And I, I tried to have as soft a, as a, soft a landing as we could. Say, well, here's the deal. You know, they got a new carpet. Boy, doesn't it make sense not to have a wedding? I mean, it was, it was, pretty, it was stupid. Okay, it was, it was stupid. Let me say it for you. Okay. And she looked at me. She said, honey, that's fine. I just want to be with you. Aww. And so now it's July 3rd. Our wedding's the next night. Well, next that later that day she called her folks and said um it got changed we're <laughs> gonna get married tomorrow night we'd still like you to come it's gonna be at the uh, community center in seal beach down by what used to be uh there was a little village there seaport village or something like that and so uh, we didn't know if her folks were going to come or not. They, by this time, I was really persona non grata. So I called my folks because they weren't too concerned. Except my mother, she said, now Wayne, she knew what our world was like that we lived in. She said, just, will you wear a, like a sport coat and a necktie? <laughs> I said, for your mom. Because I thought, this is, the, this is the least of my problems at this yeah. point. Sport coat, necktie, I can do that. All right, so I, next night we get, we go to the Bible study. Now, how, what do we do for a, a, a priest? Well, we have no priest because we're anti-everything. 
We don't even have a minister because we're anti everything. <laughs> but my roommate, some months before, had gotten the mail order certificate <laughs> for, you know, ordination. And so his name is Mike Ross. He was my good buddy who said, girls don't want to marry their friend. <laughs> so um, at the end of the uh, at the at the end of the Bible study, he says, "Well, oh, and of course we sang our own songs that we wrote. Like one, one of the songs sort of went like this, and this would sort of set the tone for you." The Lord told about a rich man. They said he did real well, but he was cool to Jesus. Now he's hot as hell. <laughs> and that, was, that was the type of music we were singing, singing during our our Bible study. Okay, and so I every now and then I catch a glass, a glance at her mother, only a glance, and I thought, oh, I'm dead. I'm just, I'm just dead. Any more, any more nonsense? And so my dad was only there half the time. He was a smoker. He'd go out for a cigarette, come back, <laughs> cigarette, come back, and I thought, well, this is good. There's less to deal with here. So finally, my buddy with his mail order ordination certificate does the wedding. And after the wedding is over, we always have time for an announcement, right? It's a Bible study, not a, not a marriage wedding. And so, um, any announcements? Alan, can't remember Alan's last name, but I'll never forget his first. And I hope I never see him again. He stood up and there's Alan with his bib overalls, long hair, long beard, and his German shepherd dog that went with him everywhere, by his side. Here we are, the community center. Brothers and sisters, there's supposed to be some good surf tonight. Meet me at the foot of the pier around midnight. We all go body surfing, whoever's up for it. I thought, this is it. <laughs> this is it. I don't have to worry about in laws. <laughs> First thing that my mother in law did, she jumped up, came over to Lynn, she said, I hope you got that wedding license signed, young lady. <laughs> And that was about it. We had no money for a honeymoon. My dad came over and said, son, do you have any, are you going to take a honeymoon? I said, dad, I don't, know. I, I don't have anything. He gave me $300. and <laughs> said, have a honeymoon. <laughs> so we went to Laguna and we stayed a couple of days. And that was the beginning of a wonderful, wonderful time. <laughs> See, you don't have to spend a lot for a wedding. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, all she wrote. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions. Thank <laughs> you.